Hey everyone, the name is Chris Borocci, welcome to Common Time 27. Today we'll talk about adjusting humbuckers and make humbuckers sound closer to singer coils, about the feel and responsiveness of amps and guitars, about songwriting, when and for which purpose I'd recommend choosing the Oxbox over others, and about Redican guitars. <laughs> RS Squire 51 seems to be that you are trying to make the LP sound like the telly. Use the LP for the LP tone and the telly for the telly tone. You're just losing the characteristics of the humbuckers uh, to get closer to a single coil sound. I want my singles to sound like singles and my humbuckers to sound like humbuckers. That's the reason for having several guitars. I absolutely agree with you. That's exactly what I want too. I want my Les Paul to sound like my ideal Les Paul, which I think is not the same type of Les Paul tone as what you're aiming for, which is absolutely fine. That's perfect. And um, everyone should, you know, find their own taste and own little thing and their own guitar should represent what they want to sound like. And uh, that is exactly what I went for. Uh, we're talking about, by the way, the that video, what I did on uh, adjusting humbuckers. And uh, you can mess around with the overall height with the pickup and with the, um, the screw pull pieces, that one row that uh, is adjustable. And uh, I like my humbuckers fairly low, even though these are PAF style pickups, these are these uh, Mojotone 59 clone low wound pickups, so not really hot, but I still like them fairly far from the strings. If you know PAFs, you put them fairly close to the strings, but compared to those other PAFs, I like them a little lower and I raise the pole pieces, especially in the neck pickup, to have a bit more articulation, a bit more snap, a bit more, well, dynamic range really. I really like this kind of tone, especially for clean and low gain sounds. And for that, this this really works and does wonders. I've That video is one of my best performing videos. A lot of people found it and a lot of people appreciate the info. And I've read literally hundreds, if not thousands of comments, people saying, finally, my Epiphone, my this and that guitar, my whatever guitar, sounds great again and I don't I don't feel like I have to swap pickups which is exactly what I wanted to achieve with this video to show you that you can tweak a humbucker in case you're not really happy with how open it sounds or how it reacts to your playing and your rest of the rig. Now about that point an LP should sound like an LP and a telly should sound like a telly end of story absolutely true but um, I was lucky enough to try to original bursts, uh, 59 and a 60s. And, um, and both had this one certain thing happening. Uh, they had this Tally-esque attack and openness. And um, of course, much warmer and you know more mid-range. You know, they sounded like Les Pauls, but they made me play, made me feel much more comfortable because I play my telly a lot, so I that's my home ground. That's where I feel most comfortable. And on those guitars, I felt like I can be me, right? I don't have to, I ha I don't have to adjust the way I pick. I don't have to adjust all my amps and pedals to feel comfortable. Those guitars just immediately worked, and that's this burst wonder everyone's talking about. I I had the chance to experience it in person. Now that's not a good thing. Because as soon as you do that and you really like it, can happen, it happened to me. Since then, I just want all Les Pauls to sound like that. Now, I don't have 300,000 euros or half a million to get one of those original ones. So what I want to do is try to get as close as possible to that tone with what I have. And what I have is an amazing Les Paul, so why not tweaking it with little things to get closest to that original 1959 and 58 and whatever that burst 
tone. And um, that tone is not the big, wooly, whatever, huge, higher output kind of Les Paul tone. That's awesome too, but I'm not really into that. I want a Les Paul to, to sound as amazing and, and exciting, clean, as like low gain, medium gain, or high gain. And you can get much closer to that kind of Les Paul tone if you do these kind of things. Here's one from Tomasz. He's a, a regular viewer and I really appreciate it. See ya, Tommy. Um, I've already learned from you that the amp has more effect on getting a great guitar sound than the guitar. But how about the feel and responsiveness? Um, yeah, so this is a debate that's gonna go on forever. Um, <laughs> the amp and the speaker has the most obvious effect on your guitar tone, but uh, that's only most important for the audience, like whoever listens to your tone. But let's be honest, we want to please ourselves as much as those who listen, right? I mean, it should be like that because it's essentially it's a, a matter of inspiration and creativity. And if you don't feel inspired, you, you will not play that good. So uh, we want to make this whole thing work for us as well. And uh, of course, it's ideal if someone else also enjoys it, not just us right so in terms of feel and responsiveness that is super hard to answer i don't think there's a generic answer to that uh, it depends on the player very much on the player and obviously also on the style like if you play high gain and have a ton of really tight really cool gain that's all that you need in terms of responsiveness. If you have the right amount of drive to feel comfortable and it's tight enough to work for palm mutes and whatever you want to do, that's all you need really. Then it's only important that you have a, a guitar that feels nice to play, like it's easy to play, the ergonomics are good, the string tension is good, etc. But as soon as you reduce the gain, uh, just me medium, low gain or even clean, um, the way your rig reacts to your playing dynamics and your your fretting and everything that's much more important than those obvious things uh, such as tightness or the amount of low frequencies or mid-range or whatever so i think i think it's 50 50. to me it's 50 50 for sure if i have a guitar that i already enjoy without plugging it in i know that i will have a good time playing whatever the amp is but if the pedal or amp just kills whatever I want to do on the guitar, that's not a good thing. So you need that other half as well to, to feel really comfortable and inspired and feel like, oh my God, my fingers are flying today. What the hell? What's happening here? That's, I think, a mixture of both. Like, for example, this is the crunch channel of the Rev. It's, um, it's just that plus the reverb in the amp turn on and the aux box gives uh, some delay. That is a great sounding low gain drive because it cleans up, it doesn't get muffled if you don't pick that hard, it just literally gets super sparkly and clean, like clean clean. And if you dig in, it does that sweet chewy drive tone. That's something that I love above anything else really. So uh, that is something that I would call a perfect match for what I'm playing, my kind of playing and, and this guitar, which also has a, a very open and very dynamic tone. So they work well together. It, it's got to be 50-50 guitar and amp. Tommy has another question as well. This is about songwriting. Um, I often come up with short melodies, guitar licks, that are about usually two to four bars long at maximum. I always feel that they are just complete and never know how to continue to write a full song, not just one motive. Did you ever have this problem? If so, do you have any ideas how to solve it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I have this problem all the time. That's why I started um, making these intro tracks in my videos. When I sit down for a recording session, set up the cameras, the lights, turn on the amp, etc. I try to come up with a riff, a lick, whatever it is, a melody or a few chords, whatever it is, 
I try to come up with something, then I, um, I turn on a metronome to see what the tempo is, then I program some basic drums, throw in some backing tracks if necessary or a bass, and then record that, what I just wrote, on camera on the fly. And I started doing that because first of all, I wanted to show whatever I play that day in context, which is, I think, a very important factor. So it's it's not just a waste of time, really. When you're watching a video like this and you hear that pedal, that guitar, that amp in a song, that's already a very crucial part of uh, the experience of hearing that or playing that piece of gear. But also, it was a really interesting, inspiring training for me to, to get past just having one riff. Because usually it's like a minute long or one minute, 15 seconds long. And just playing four chords through that time can be a little underwhelming. <laughs> so I try to come up with like at least one part plus an extra, like an ending, or one part and a, and a second part, like an A and B section. And, um, and that helped me so much, like without the intention of stretching it to be like a three and a half, four and a half, five and a half minute long song, which is a much bigger chunk of original, you know, piece and like music. Um, I just wanted to stick a second section to that one thing that I just wrote. And that already puts some of that pressure away, like aside, and lets you just go like, I don't know, this will probably be terrible, but let's say I have this idea. I don't have any ideas right now. Whatever that was, uh, it's just a riff. Um, and I try to sing that in my head, not really the notes, but the, the groove of it, like do down. And then if there's a rhythm that sticks that I want to continue, then I stick to that. If there's a melody that comes, like a, a like a vocal melody or a solo melody, then I'll I'll take that as my basic and and work my way around that, like write chords under it. Just loop it and listen to it a couple of times, walk around in the room, sing it with, or just headbang or whatever the you know style is really. Just groove onto it and just listen it listen to it a couple of times, then push stop and try to see if anything happens, anything comes. If you have like a, a, a mood after it, if it's like this, like classic rock style, something, do you want to stick to that? Do you want to still do something like rock style? Or do you want to, I don't know, put in a, a huge chord and let it ring? Or do you want something that's much more chilled or whatever that is, you know, it always depends on your current mood and that's what's so inspiring. That's why you cannot really teach songwriting because it's up to you how you feel in that specific moment. So um, for now, I would, uh, how is it? I think I forgot it already. It took me to ACDC land. <laughs> Just try it, whatever sticks, if it's a rhythm, if it's a, a melody as told, or some chords, try them out. If it takes you somewhere you want to be, then stick to it, record it before you forget it. If it's weird and just basic and boring, then, you know, throw it away and look for the next piece of uh, inspiration. Little baby steps at a time. That's my short advice. <laughs> This one came on Instagram. This was a message request from uh, Garrett Southgate. Uh, by the way, in case you're on Instagram and follow me on Instagram and write me messages and I don't react, so sorry. I it's it's a mess. That that menu like showing all the message requests is is a is a dark place. <laughs> so sorry. I cannot keep up with those um, private messages. Sorry if I miss yours. Garrett asks, Hi Chris, do you write original songs? Yes, I do. I am in the middle of recording my first solo album. Uh, so that's gonna come out in 2024. I guess maybe spring, maybe summer, that, that kind of vibe. And uh, also earlier, like uh, back when I was uh, living in Budapest before 2008, um, I was in, um, I was in a number of bands, but we had like this one like traditional metal band and um, it was called Tuzmodan and we released uh, 
two albums with me and then one or two more after I left uh, the country. But um, those are amazing. So yeah, uh, a lot of original stuff have happened and are still happening. Um, as told, album coming out soon. This one is from Remus and we're talking about relicking guitar necks, especially for the first question, the back of the neck. Um, what is the final sanding grit before you apply the walnut paint? Um, two things about this. Uh, first of all, it's not walnut paint I used on that guitar. I think we're talking about this baby, where I uh, removed, like, I, I removed all the finish from the back of the neck and uh, applied stain. Stain is this, uh, I think, water, usually water-based, um, kind of transparent color that sinks into the pores of the wood. So it's not paint that you apply on top, like a like a lacquer or something. It's something that soaks, that wood soaks in and will become, like, will sort of color the wood itself instead of sitting on top of the wood. The second thing is the sanding grit. Um, I usually use fairly um, smooth grit uh, sanding paper, but we're not talking about like a thousand or twelve hundred or whatever. It's like, I think the smoothest one, the last one is like six hundred. That's already really smooth for bare wood. Uh, and also you have to pay attention to the wood grain. If the wood grain runs like this, which it should if it's a guitar neck, um, you, you don't cross the grain, you go with the grain. And um, that's to avoid scratches on the surface of the wood. Second question was, when you say walnut paint, what is actually the brand of the paint and are you diluting it with water? Um, nope, this is um, already mixed. So what I use is already has the right amount of water, like stain and water mixed together. Um, this, I cannot remember the brand, honestly, but if you ask for stain, wood stain, in any hardware store or like woodworking, whatever special store, uh, or go online and look for wood stain, or translate it to your language, and you will see what differences between paint and stain. You can get wood stain in so many shapes and forms. Just make sure that what you get is already mixed to be used, and you don't have to mess around with, uh, you know, mixing it with water or whatever else. And his last question was, for how long should I let the walnut paint, again, walnut stain, big difference, uh, cure before applying the ash and the oil. Okay, I gotta, I gotta grab that guitar now because uh, I have to show what he means. So this is the neck we're talking about. It's uh, unfinished in the middle section and uh, I used that walnut stain to make it look less super white because maple is like really bright. So I applied two, maybe three layers, can I remember? And then you definitely wanna leave it there for hours. It should dry out as much as it can before you close that whole thing. Because if you apply oil, um, you sort of imprison that moisture. And that's not cool, because <laughs> you want your neck to be stable. And then uh, with ash, he means actual ash. Uh, that's something that I applied, like I took some ash from like a campfire, like our oven, um, put it on my finger and just rub it in the wood. That is literally just to make it darker and look a little nastier. And then oil is what uh, has to be the last step, uh, just to protect the wood from uh, moisture and sweat and everything that helps to, to keep it stable, really, and healthy. And this one is from David Mathai. Sorry, David, if I butchered your last name. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate you hanging out. Uh, David is also um, a regular viewer. Hey Chris, cool video. I've had the Oxbox for over a year now and I'm more than happy with it. We're talking about this thing here. Uh, it's a, a power attenuator, power soak, power load box, and also it has a, a really powerful side, which is the cabinet and mic simulation. Uh, so it's, uh, that's the digital side of it. Um, so you can play completely quietly. Uh, you can record yourself quietly. You can plug in headphones and just use your amp connected to that without any cabinet. So it does that to not just the load box and power tenure function. I got the Fry at Power Station six months ago. I'm a Marshall player and hardly know anything else. My main amp for over 10 years has been the JVM 410H. For me, one of the best amps in the world. But now my question is, for which purpose would you recommend the Oxbox 
or the power station. I play both and enjoy listening to my beloved 2x12 Bogner cabinet every now and then. The Augsbox has a power soak built in, uh, what, five, five steps, and it does a fantastic job. It's a reactive load, so it, it is like as high quality as it gets. That being said, the Fryat power station is by far my favorite power attenuator. So if you don't want to completely mute your tube amp, I would, I would recommend using the power station. If you still want to use your cabinet, like 2x12 Bogner, you said, I would stick to the power station for that because, uh, first of all, it doesn't just attenuate, it's, it's a tricky one and it sounds amazing. It's indescribable how great it feels and sounds at any volume, from whispering quiet to full-on um, you know, cranked sound, like stage volume. So that's, that's amazing about it, but also it has um, an effects loop. And that is, especially if we're talking about amps where the effects loop is not awesome, <laughs> or the power amp also saturates a bit, which then distorts everything that you put in your effects loop, that's especially on like Black Sea style amps. If you don't want that, you can use the power station's effects loop which is definitely after all that saturation because the, the power station's power amp, which it has, a tube power amp, is tuned to be super clean, like as much headroom as humanly possible. So you can safely use that um, as told on amps where the effects loop is not awesome or on amps that don't even have any effects loop. So if you're mainly sticking to using your guitar cabinet and just want to make your amp quieter, the power station is mighty and sounds and feels wow it's crazy good so for that i would recommend using that more and if you want to stick to quiet practices quiet playings on stage or wherever you are not allowed to be loud or quiet recordings like use the oxbox's uh, simulation side that is undescribably natural, amazing. I am literally recording my full album without any cabinets, any microphones for the guitar. Uh, I'm using the Oxbox um, for, for every guitar sound. Well, almost every. I also use the, um, the built-in two notes in the Rev D20, D40, uh, but that's new and I already recorded a lot of the guitars, so it's mostly the Oxbox and I am so happy with the sounds. It's just incredible that digital emulation side of, uh, of the aux is at this point still unbeatable. Um, yeah, that's my long and winding answer. <laughs> All right, guys, take it easy. Let me know in the comments below if you have anything you want to ask or just add to whatever I said. And um, yeah, I'll be back with a new video next week. Bye. Bye.